and of course we know ACS is divided into something called a STEMI and a NSTEMI and stable angina complex but I'm not going to use that term I'm going to use a different term which is the current correct terminology that is ST ACS that is ST segment elevation <music>
So we know subendocardial portion um, is the most vulnerable portion for ischemia. So if it's not a total occlusion, the subendocardial portion is the one that's going to go for infarct. At the same time, why it is multifocal? Because of two reasons. One, they are having multivessel involvement and at the same time, they are having phasic distal embolization which can produce shower of embolus to different, different areas producing multifocal infarction. All right. So what are the implications of these now? So we have to see the ECG findings now. So what the ECG is going to show? So this is what you are going to get in the setting of a STEMI or a STACS. So what is this basically? It's nothing but an ST elevation that you are seeing. So why do you get ST elevation? This ST elevation are actually basically due to injury currents that are produced from the transmural infarcted myocardium. So these are due to injury currents. And at the same time, another significant feature is the development of the Q waves. That's why uh, this type of uh, ST elevation ACS or STEMI is also referred to as a Q wave MI. Q wave myocardial infection. Why do you develop a Q wave? That is due to death of the myocardium. Remember, just simple transmural infarction without death will produce only ST elevation. But transmural infarction with death will result in the development of Q waves, the mechanisms of which will be discussed subsequently in the ECG chapters. So, you can get a Q wave with a STEMI with, with a high frequency, in fact. So what you're going to get in the setting of a NSTACS. So in NSTACS, you are typically going to get uh, something like this. You will be basically getting a ST segment depression or probably even a T wave inversion. So anything can happen. So ST segment depression with an upper T wave is the most common finding. But uh, what are the ways of presentation? We'll be discussing subsequently in the ECG section. But this is very classical. That is ST segment depression, especially a down sloping uh, depression or a horizontal depression is going to have a lot of significance which we'll be discussing subsequently once again in the ECG chapters. Remember, ST elevations can be localized and you can you know, like understand uh, by a hint that uh, since the transmural infarcts are usually focal and they can be localized, the ST elevations that are coming from that local areas, focal areas can also be localized. On the other hand, these ST depressions and T wave inversions cannot be localized. And for example, if you have only ST depression in 2, 3, if you cannot tell that the patient is having an inferior wall NSTACS, so it cannot be localized. That's very, very important. Cannot be localized. And when the ST depressions are very, very significant, especially if the ST depressions are present in V4, V5, V6, these are the leads that are supposed to have a significant ST depression or that are supposed to be significant in the first place. If you have ST depressions and T wave inversions in 2, 3 AVF that are mostly non-significant, especially if you see in only one lead, but if you see in V4, V5, V6, ST depression, that becomes really, really significant. But anyways, so finally, final nutshell, we have ST, ACS, typically evolves to produce a Q wave myocardial infection and NST, ACS, typically evolves to produce a non-Q wave myocardial infection. Suppose if a patient with ST ACS have been treated very, very faster and you have reperfused, then they might become a non-Q wave myocardial infection as well. Suppose if the patient with NST ACS have not been treated at all, then the thrombus might expand over a period of time, can produce a full thickness in fact, and they can produce a transmural infection and they can evolve into a Q wave MI. So which means most often STACs will produce a QAMI, but it's not always the rule. Most often NSTACs will produce a non qa myocardial infection, and once again, it's not always a hard and fast rule. And what about the troponins? Troponin levels definitely elevated, as I told you before, and there will be a serious elevation in the setting of a STACs because it's a full thickness, complete in fact. Whereas in the setting of a NSTACs, troponin elevation can happen or troponins can be normal as well. This is a very important thing. So previously, we have distinguished the NSTEMI and unstable angina pathologically and clinically based on the troponin values only. Troponin values are elevated, we call it as NSTEMI. If the troponin values are normal, we call it as unstable angina. But remember, currently, these troponin elevations are not used to classify in the first place because those classification systems are absurd and it's going to only create a lot of confusion. So leave all those things. 
So if the troponin is elevated, it indicates more severity and a poor prognosis. That's all, irrespective of whether it's a STEMI or irrespective of whether it's a NSTEMI, unstable angina, or irrespective of whether there is uh, some other cardiac disorder. Elevated troponin is always a high risk. You have to always note that. So elevated troponin means it is having some problem in the uh, heart. That's all. So ischemic troponin elevation is what we refer to as myocardial infarction. But anyway, it's fine. So that doesn't really matter as of now because uh, it's not going to change the treatment as well. You're going to treat and stemi and unstable angina in the same way. That's all. So finally, going on to the type of the clot that you're going to develop in the setting of a STEMI is a fibrin clot. So that is why fibrinolysis is very, very effective. Especially if you do within the first uh, two to three hours, fibrinolysis is going to be extremely effective in breaking the clot because it's made of fibrin. Once it's organized, it's difficult to break as the time goes on. But it is subacute in nature where the fibrin would have washed away by autofibrinolysis because that is happening in the body. So they will be more of a white clot. So they will be containing more of platelets compared to the fibrin. So that's the reason why I can call this uh, STEMI clots as red clots and uh, end STEMI clots as white clots. Even though gross appearance will not uh, be exactly like what we are describing in technical terms. So what are the goals of therapy? So what do you have to do in the setting of a STEMI? It's a full thing, I mean, uh, full occlusion, 100% occlusion. So you have to try to reperfuse as soon as possible, which means you have to open up the vessel through some form of revascularization like fibrinolysis or a PCA, and you have to reduce the infarct size. Remember, infarct does not necessarily mean the myocardium is dead. It is still suffering on the verge of death. If you reperfuse very, very faster, within the first 30 or uh, 30 minutes or one hour, there is a lot of chance that you can escape even without any infarction. So to reduce the infarct size, that's one of the primary goals of treating a STEMI. And third is to reduce the complications because STEMI is associated with more in hospital complication compared to NSTEMI and stable angina complex and you have to increase the survival of the patient. These are the goals. And to achieve these goals, the primary modality we are going to use is something called a reperfusion. There are two ways of reperfusion. One is the thrombolysis, which is highly effective in STEMI because it's an acute clot, more of fibrin, so you can easily break down, especially if you do in the first two to three hours, it's highly, highly effective. But even though the window period is up to 12 hours, which we'll be discussing subsequently, but uh, it's better to do as early as possible within the first two to three hours. Second mode of reperfusion, which is the gold standard mode of reperfusion is primary uh, PCA, that is percutaneous coronary intervention, which is done on a primary basis as a first line therapy. That's the best one. If the thrombolysis has failed, we'll go for rescue PCA, which we'll be discussing subsequently, but either PCA or lysis, these are the modes of reperfusion. That's what we're going to do. And whether you will use GP2B3A inhibitors or not, GP2B inhibitors are not that effective in the setting of a STEMI patient. It's not used typically in STEMI patients unless uh, you are taking for a PCA, unless PCA is done. So before, as a preparation for PCA, you can uh, give a GP2B3 inhibitor, but GP2B3 inhibitor as such as a treatment option for a STEMI is not that helpful because GP2B3 inhibitors, you know, we have discussed in hematology are basically antiplatelet agents. They're going to be anti-aggregating agents. So this is more of a fibrin clot, less platelets, more fibrin, so they're not that helpful. Unless and until you take the patient for a PCA, where it is given before the PCA as a prophylactic basis. And echocardiogram, on the other hand, typically shows a new regional wall motion abnormality, which is extremely common. They'll show a new RWM, that's a regional wall motion abnormality. What do you mean by that? So if one particular area of the myocardium is infarcted, that area may not contract properly and it might show hypokinesia or akinesia. That's what we refer to as a new regional wall motion abnormality. Existing will not come under an MI or could be uh, due to old MI, but new means it's an acute MI. And what are the goals of therapy in the setting of uh, NSTACS? Here the goals of therapy is to reduce the thrombus progression because the thrombus has not completely occluded the vessel. So you have to reduce the thrombus progression here. And at the same time, you have to reduce the distal embolization that is happening. And you have to prevent recurrent ischemia. Because most of the NSTACS patients will be having multivessel disease. So you have to prevent recurrent ischemia. So for this, 
you can use anticoagulation as a mainstay like for example you can use heparins and the heparin of choice is of course the low molar heparin which is having strongest students which we'll be discussing subsequently or you can use GP2B3A inhibitors and GP2B3 inhibitors are really really helpful whether you do PCA or not in the setting of NSTSS because it's more of a platelet clot and anti-aggregating agents anti-platelet agents like GP2B3 inhibitors are very very helpful in this setting that's why and heparins we use because we need to reduce the thrombus progression and we have to prevent the phasic distal embolization that's why we are using heparins in this setting and apart from that you need to do a coronary angiography. I'm not telling you should necessarily do a PC, but it's important to do a coronary angiogram sometime, be depending on the risk which we'll be discussing subsequently in the NSTACS chapter. So you have to do a coronary angiogram to assess the coronary vessel status or a coronary artery status. Similarly, echocardiogram in the setting of NSTACS may be completely variable. It can be completely normal or can show a global dyskinesia or a global dysfunction because it's multifocal embolic infarcts at multiple different places. So they might have a global dysfunction of the heart or very rarely they might show a regional wall motion abnormality also. So it's highly, highly variable in the setting of a NSTACS.